Good evening and welcome to the American Journal of Pharmacy Benefits Quality Forum. The Quality Forum has been developed in collaboration with the Pharmacy Times Office of Continuing Professional Education, the Pharmacy Quality Alliance, and the American Journal of Pharmacy Benefits. Tonight's forum is a discussion of how can the implementation of quality measures improve outcomes in the treatment of dyslipidemia. My name is Mitzi Wasik and I am the Director of Medicare Clinical Pharmacy at Aetna. I will be the moderator for tonight's forum, and I would like to welcome my colleagues who will be joining me in tonight's discussion. Hi, I'm Dr. Gregory Pokrivka. I'm the director of the Baltimore Lipid Center, and I'm also assistant professor in general internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Hi, I'm Dan Roman. I'm a senior research associate at NCQA, which is the National Committee for Quality Assur Assurance. NCQA is a nonprofit measure development organization, and we develop the HEDIS uh, volume of measures, um, and we also support um, uh, other measure sets uh, uh, implementation and accreditation and recognition programs. Um, some of the programs um, are Medicare Advantage star ratings and the EHR incentive program or meaningful use. Hi, I'm Julie Cool. I'm vice president for perform. Uh, member measure operations at the Pharmacy Quality Alliance. Pharmacy Quality Alliance is a nonprofit member based organization that develops medication performance measures for health plans and pharmacies. PQA has a diverse membership of over 165 members, and our metrics are developed and endorsed by PQA members. PQA members are used in the CMS STAR rating program, in URAC's accreditation program, in the quality rating system for health uh, insurance marketplaces and by other organizations that are measuring health plans and pharmacies on their use of medication. Great, thank you everyone for joining us this evening to discuss a disease state that despite a wide array of effective treatment options has been and continues to be challenging to manage both from a clinical and economic standpoint. We would like to thank our supporters for this program Please note that this program has been supported through an educational grant from Santa Fe Aventus US and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, as well as an educational donation provided by Amgen. First, we'd like to review the learning objectives for the evening. First, identify key guideline updates for the management of dyslipidemia elevated LDL, including challenges and controversies surrounding their implementation. Explain existing and emerging emerging quality metrics within CMS programs related to the treatment of dyslipidemia to managed care professionals. Illustrate the roles, key trial data, and therapy considerations of approved and emerging therapies for LDL lowering in patients with dyslipidemia. And finally, document the economic and healthcare utilization impact associated with dyslipidemia and the treatment of these disorders. So to start the conversation off, we're going to turn to Dr. Pakrivka to start with an overview of the current practice of dyslipidemia management. Thanks, Mitzi. Um, when we look, think about cardiovascular disease in the United States, we have to be aware that nearly three quarters of a million people died or had a cardiovascular event in the latest 2011 statistics. This is one of every three deaths in, in the United States. More people die from cardiovascular disease every year than all forms of cancer put together. So it's a very prevalent disease. Um, now, we, we, we see someone who dies every 43 seconds from this disease. We want to try to find biomarkers so we can identify who's at risk. And traditionally, we use the lipid panel. We look at an LDL cholesterol, an HDL cholesterol, and other parameters. The prevalence of elevated LDLC is quite high. 31% of men in the United States have an elevated LDL cholesterol, according to 2010 statistics. Women, 24% have an elevated LDL cholesterol. If you look at adults age 40 to 64, about 27% of adults have an elevated LDL cholesterol. If you look at older adults, 65 to 74, 30% have an elevated LDL cholesterol. So very high incidence of LDL cholesterol elevation. Of course, we have many different strategies we can use to reduce LDL cholesterol, including diet and medications. What about HDL cholesterol? You know, we traditionally call HDL the good cholesterol. We have to rethink that. Cholesterol is neither good nor bad. It's where it's going 
uh, when it's really a problem. Cholesterol is bad when it gets into your coronary arteries and causes plaque buildup, resulting in clinical events. But low HDL cholesterol uh, tends to be a marker for high numbers of atherogenic clot-forming LDL particles. About 20% of Americans have low HDL cholesterol. When this is accompanied by high triglycerides, and we see that pattern, low HDLC, high triglycerides, increasing in incidence as we get fatter and fatter in the United States with the rising incidence of obesity, prediabetes, and diabetes. So that low HDLC pattern is much more dangerous when accompanied by a high triglyceride level. Um, now, uh, let's talk about the role of LDL cholesterol and cholesterol metabolism and cholesterol disorders. If you look at the slide, um, you can see that what really matters here is in every patient I see, I try to assess, do they have abnormal lipoprotein trafficking? Because fats, cholesterol and triglycerides, are insoluble in the bloodstream. They can't just float around in the bloodstream. They have to be packaged into transportation vehicles known as lipoproteins. So abnormal lipoprotein trafficking is really what results in the buildup of plaque in clinical events. When you have too many LDL particles in circulation, they're more likely to penetrate into the subendothelial space, cause plaque formation, incite inflammation, and cause clinical events. So what we really need in every patient is a way to assess whether or not we have this abnormal uh, lipoprotein trafficking. We traditionally use LDLC, which is the cholesterol content of LDL particles. We traditionally use that as a way to count and assess risk, and we've also used it as a target. But this is an imperfect biomarker. There often is a discordance between the number of LDL particles and risk as determined by LDL cholesterol content. So we're looking at several different parameters here. Um, the analogy I like to use the most is if we think of uh, LDL particles as trucks on a road. Okay, we, we look at LDL particles as dump trucks delivering atherogenic cholesterol into the endothelial wall. You know, why do you get a traffic jam at five o'clock? Too many trucks on the road. Too many LDL particles, you're gonna get more plaque buildup, you're gonna get more events. It's not the cholesterol content of these particles that's dangerous, it's actually the number of particles themselves. And LDL cholesterol is an imperfect way to measure this. What are triglycerides? Triglycerides are the other often forgotten fat in the bloodstream. Triglycerides don't get into plaque, but they're often associated with, with large numbers of LDL particles, which is a very atherogenic situation. So low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, we see this with increasing incidence in our overweight patients, our obese patients, our diabetic patients. Um, so abnormal LDL trafficking is really what drives the accumulation of LDL particles. Dr. Pogrifka, um, you just kind of went through the background of all of the LDL particles, and we know that there's multiple treatment guidelines out there. So how do you manage the patient with all of those guidelines that are currently published? Traditionally, we use uh, LDL cholesterol reduction as a target. Okay, so we're trying to reduce LDL cholesterol. We always start with uh, dietary measures. We start with lifestyle modification. Sometimes we have to go to drug therapy. Often we have to go to drug therapy. And we have several traditional pharmacologic strategies, really the statin drugs or the backbone of our current therapies. Statins inhibit the synthesis of cholesterol in the liver, which results in a, in a reflex upregulation of LDL receptors removing LDL particles from the bloodstream. Um, other agents such as ezetimibe and bile acid sequestrants accomplish the same thing to a, to a lesser degree through different mechanisms. These are helper drugs which are often added on the statins. Niacin in the past was thought of as an ideal agent because it not only lowered LDL cholesterol and triglycerides, it also increased HDL cholesterol, but its role has come into question recently due to several clinical trials which have showed adding niacin to a statin really didn't seem to um, diminish risk. It, it really um, uh, did not decrease events on top of the statin. So we have existing right now many limitations in our, in our current toolkit. Many patients can't tolerate statins. Many patients' the statins aren't strong enough. Um, many patients um, uh, are, are just uh, unable to afford statins, for example. Some of the branded statins are still quite expensive. Uh, we have uh, less expensive generics. If we look at statistics, only about 30% of patients who should be treated are getting treated. And of those patients, after one year, only about 40 to 50% are still taking the therapy. So there's a large unmet need in terms of getting patients uh, to goal where we want them to be. So I think that's a statistic that we see in the literature quite frequently, that only 40 to 50% of patients are still taking their therapy. 
as a clinician, how do you address that with your patients? Um, well, I, I think education is the most important thing. I, uh, I see patients, I saw a patient today who was more afraid of taking the medications than he was of the disease itself. And I spend a lot of time educating patients to fear the disease rather than the medications. But very fortunately now we have uh, a couple of new tools, a new class of drugs just recently approved, which I think will help us to get past this adherence problem. And these are known as the PCSK9 inhibitors. And this is a tongue twister, pro-protein convertase subtilisin kexin type 9. Okay, PCSK9 is an enzyme that participates in uh, the destruction of LDL receptors. So if you look at the uh, right-hand portion of the slide you have in front of you, you can see what happens in a normal situation where you have PCSK9 binds along with the LDL receptor, binds an LDL particle, and is uh, by an endocytosis um, mechanism is taken into the cell in the form of a lysozyme. Then uh, PCSK9 will target the LDL receptor for destruction. Okay, this is not good because when you wind up with fewer LDL receptors, as you can see on the right-hand portion of the slide, you have fewer receptors out there to grab onto LDL particles and remove them. So not a good situation. Now statins, ironically, as wonderful as they are, they tend to increase PCSK9 levels. So you actually have PCSK9 is actually an opposing force that prevents statins from um, lowering LDL cholesterol as well as we would like. So we've developed monoclonal antibodies known as PCSK9 inhibitors, which you can see on the left-hand portion of your slide. So if you have a targeted monoclonal antibody, which removes PCSK9, you will get less degradation of LDL receptors. You'll wind up with more LDL receptors to get rid of those bad particles and take them um, um, out of circulation. So PCSK9 inhibitors have been shown epidemiologically to be associated with longevity because the, uh, the patients who have natural PCSK9 uh, inhibition genetically tend to live a much longer lifespan. They have a very much lower LDL cholesterol, et cetera. So we can use that data to develop a new drug class of monoclonal antibodies known as the PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, so I think you know, PCSK9 inhibitors will be very helpful on top of statins to help to get our, uh, the LDL reduction that we need uh, to reduce clinical events in our patients. Um, next, I'm going to sort of segue into the guidelines for managing hypercholesterolemia. And one of the problems in my field of, of clinical lipidology right now is we have too many guidelines. Um, uh, every society has its guidelines. There's European guidelines, Canadian guidelines, et cetera. In the U.S., we traditionally have used the National Cholesterol Education Program, ATP3 guidelines. These were developed in 2002, were updated in 2004. Um, the, uh, the most recent update, which was supposed to be ATP4, didn't occur because of uh, disagreement among um, various factions of scientists, cardiologists, lipidologists, et cetera. So the uh, American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association came up with its own set of guidelines known as the ACC AHA 2013 guidelines. Now, the, uh, when we compare and contrast the National Lipid Association patient-centered recommendations with these ACC AHA recommendations, we can always start with uh, the evidence base. The ACC guidelines, uh, the committee was charged with, uh, with using only randomized clinical trial data. And obviously that's a good thing because randomized clinical trials are really the gold standards for establishing efficacy and safety. A limitation here though is that randomized clinical trials haven't been conducted for every single clinical situation. For example, we only have clinical trials for um, patients from age 40 to about uh, 75. So the, the guidelines, the ACC AHA guidelines are very strictly adherent to randomized clinical trial data. And their, their charge, the basic philosophy behind these guidelines are to identify groups of patients who we have randomized clinical trial data will respond to statins with risk reduction. So there are four uh, groups of patients where we have excellent RCT data, randomized clinical trial data, this, that they will respond to statins. Patients with clinical CVD, if you've already had an event, heart attack, stroke, et cetera, you should be on a statin. We have evidence that that will reduce risk. If you're a diabetic between ages 45 to 70, and your LDL cholesterol is between 70 and 189, we know this subset of patients, we can get risk reduction with high intensity statin. If you don't have diabetes and you're between ages 45 to 70, and you have an LDL cholesterol between 70 and 189, then we use a risk calculator. It's called the pooled risk calculator. It's available as an app for any of your smartphones. 
uh, downloadable for free from the American College of Cardiology website. You, what you do in this situation is you determine 10 year risk. If it's greater than or equal to 7.5%, then you would go ahead and initiate statin therapy. Uh, and the fourth group are those with LDL cholesterols greater than or equal to 190. Here you're going to have your genetic dyslipidemia, such as heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, which is actually much more common than um, most of you may realize. One in 350 Americans has genetic uh, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, so it's very common. Um, now let's contrast this with the National Lipid Association um, guidelines. Maybe we can um, pass to the next slide. Okay. Um, so with the National, uh, with the National Lipid Association guidelines, uh, the points of emphasis are somewhat different. Here we, we're using a, a much wider evidence base. We're recognizing that, that there are other forms of evidence besides randomized clinical trials. There's uh, pathophysiologic data, there's observational data, there's um, uh, scientific data, there's lipid and lipoprotein data. So we're using a, a much broader data set. So we can cover a wider range of clinical situations. What do we do with that 30-year-old comes into the office? I saw someone today in the mid-30s. He doesn't fit into the ACC AHA guidelines, but I know, you know that I can extend the biological process down to his age group, even though we really don't have randomized clinical trial data. So that's one significant difference between these two sets of evidence. Um, so the central focus in the NLA recommendations is to assess risk in the individual patient. So we're assessing that risk by looking at clinical risk factors such as hypertension, low HDLC, family history, et cetera. Um, th then we're making a determination of what target we want that patient to get to. So we're, we're bringing back, in a sense, absolute numerical targets. Even though we don't have RCT data proving those targets, there's enough accumulated evidence we believe in the National Lipid Association to justify the use of absolute targets as a way of measuring patient adherence, as a way of measuring the efficacy of statin therapy once we initiate it. And I have to say, it, it, it gets a little confusing when you talk about targets because many people are portraying the ACC AHA guidelines as being without targets. And that's not strictly true. The ACC AHA guidelines say when you find a patient in one of those four risk groups, you initiate high intensity statin therapy you do then remeasure LDL cholesterol to make sure they're getting the 50% reduction they should be getting. So in a sense, there are percentage reduction targets. Um, in the National Lipid Association guidelines, we're still dealing with absolute targets because we believe there's uh, some use for that. Um, we also have coined the term atherogenic cholesterol. Now I talked about in my previous slide, what we really need to do is count LDL particles, not just use LDL cholesterol as a traditional surrogate. So we're using non-HDL cholesterol, which is a simple, uh, inexpensive, doesn't cost anything, uh, methodology of counting LDL particles. So non-HDL is total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol. If my total is 150, my HDL cholesterol is 50, my non-HDL would then be 100. And that calculated parameter, which just took me a second to do, that is a much better marker of risk, and we believe it's a much better target. Um, in terms of more accurately predicting who's going to get a reduction in the, the disease we're trying to prevent. Many times you'll have a patient who's at LDL cholesterol goal, but they won't be at non-HDL goal. What do you do with that patient? There's evidence out there from clinical trial data that if we intensify therapy and get the non-HDL to goal, we will also reduce residual risk. So, so non-HDL cholesterol is a big part of the National Lipid Association uh, guidelines. So I think that's about all I wanted to say on that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Pogrifka, for that uh, good overview of the management of dyslipidemia, as well as some of the difference in the guidelines. So I think that's a good opportunity maybe to pose a question to Julie um, and Dan. How do the organizations decide which guidelines to use? Dr. Pogrifka just kind of went over the differences there, and how do you decide as an organization which ones are going to be the development of your measures? Well, so for NCQA, um, you know, ideally we like it when the guidelines align, which they don't always align. In those cases, um, we typically will um, do a fairly thorough review of the different conflicting guidelines to try to better understand why they don't align. I mean, sometimes it depends on the, it, it's the perspective of the organization. Some are at a, a higher level or, or more, uh, uh, are focusing on more of like individualized therapy. So there's lots of reasons why they might 
um, not align. And so we kind of have to get a sense of why that is. Another uh, really important step for us is we will work with our advisory panel. So we have a cardiovascular advisory panel. We have our committee on performance measurement. We have uh, uh, advisory panels for almost every condition for which we have a measure. And so we typically will consult with them to try to get a sense of uh, the direction that we should take. And sometimes it's you shouldn't develop a measure around this certain topic area. Julie, I don't know if that's... Yeah, no, same thing with PQA. We have a number of panels that and experts in the field that are going to address these things. And what we've done, especially for our most, our most recent statin in diabetes measures, we only looked at the ACCAHA guideline because of the clinical evidence, the high standard, but then we only drew from one part of that where it really supported the use of a measure. Um, you know, I would say, just as a, an aside, they say that one of the nice things about guidelines is there are so many to choose from. And, you know, that's clearly what's going right. on here. Great. Thanks, guys. So now, um, Dan, if you want to walk us through um, the current and emerging quality metrics for the dyslipidemia treatment. Sure. I mean, uh, let me start just by backing up and talking a little bit about um, kind of the role of quality measures. I think that a lot of uh, people don't understand always measures. It's not just the point. The point of measurement is not just to quantify um, healthcare outcomes and processes. The point of it is to improve quality. Um, and measurement provides us with a means of doing so by um, um, establishing uh, baselines and benchmarks. Um, by being uh, by providing an ability to track progress or improvement, and by being able to um, uh, track uh, deterioration if that is the case, um, measures a good measure will um, will be you know clinically important. It'll be transparent, so you'll know what it is you're actually measuring. Um, it'll allow for feasible and valid um, and reliable collection of results. Um, good measures are. Um, auditable and they're actionable as in you know when you see what is going on in a measure you can actually do something to try to improve your results or your performance and then finally and this gets to what Dr. Prokofka was talking about about the evidence with the ACC and HA and the National Lipid Association measures need to be based in evidence um, and in the case of a lot of the measures that were out there previous to the ACCHA uh, 2013 ACCHA guidelines um, they were focused on the targets um, so when the ACC and HA came out with their recommendation that um, targets, they, they made no recommendation for the use of targets. And they plainly said that targets should not be used in performance measures. So that effectively stripped out the base uh, from under a lot of performance measures. Um, when that happened, NCQA, and I think along with a, a, a other organizations, were uh, kind of forced to look within and decide, do we need to retire our measures? And so that is what NCQA did. Um, in 2014, we worked with all of our advisory panels um, and uh, did our own evidence review and assessment of the guidelines and decided that we would retire our um, LDLC uh, screening and control measure and then also the LDLC screening and control components of our diabetes, comprehensive diabetes care measure. Um, and so those were removed from the HEDIS volume and our recognition programs. So Julie, at PQA, what are the current measures that are being used for adherence? So PQA developed in 2008 uh, a PDC measure, an adherence measure for statins. And the measure only uses prescription claims data, so it's reported at health plans and can also be reported at, um, at the pharmacy level. In 2009, this was endorsed by National Quality Forum. So the measure specifications use um, a common methodology used to look at adherence of a proportion of days covered. And this isn't terribly co complicated. When you think about a prescription claim that has days supply and the fill date, and really the measure looks at, in a measurement period, how many days that patient actually had, um, had the day supply or the medication on hand. So, you know, there is another saying, I'm not going to, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to say it. Uh, I think it was Everett Koop who said, if you don't have the medication, you, you, it can't help you. If you don't take it, it can't help you. So paraphrasing it, but clearly you have to have the measure, medication on hand. So that's what this measure does, looks at the, the number of days supply in a measurement year where the, the patient actually has the medication on hand. Uh, we don't know if that patient takes the medication, so that's a limitation. But for now, looking at claims data only, that's the best measure we have, the methodology for um, adherence. So the therapeutic category is restricted just to statin medications. 
and it looks at a population who has received two uh, medication prescription fills for statins in that measurement period. And then looks at the proportion of days covered during that measurement period. And the threshold for the measure is 80%. So the patient to um, achieve uh, a yes in the measure is, uh, has at least 80 out of 100 days or 80% of that measurement time um, with medication available to them. So right now this measure is used by the CMS star ratings. It's one of only 13 measures for um, Part D plans, uh, for just standalone Part D plans. And the weighting in the STARS program, since it's a clinically relevant measure, it has a three times weighting. And there's been gradual improvement in the measure. So uh, as Dan suggested, you want a measure that can be improved. And clearly health plans and pharmacists have improved on this measure. For MAPDs, that rate, proportion of days covered, that achieved that 80% threshold has increased from 68% in 2012 to 74% in 2015. And for standalone PDPs, uh, the rate has increased even a little bit more, 69% in 2012 to 77% in 2015. So this is an actionable measure where it can be improved, and it is. Uh, the measure is also used in quality rating systems for the 2000 beta tests for qualified health plans in the marketplace exchange um, and also by other plans, Integrated Health Alliance, and it's being reported to pharmacies through Pharmacy Quality um, Society. So uh, the, PQR, uh, the PQS system actually reports the measure to the pharmacy um, looking at all of the health plans that that pharmacy provides um, prescriptions to patients and then reports it out as a measure so they can see over their whole patient population how they're doing on this measure. So Mitzi, uh, I know that you have been trying to improve this measure and I'm sure you have. So tell us some of the success stories you've had. Well, I think out of all three of the adherence measures um, for the CMS STARS measure, statins is definitely the hardest to move. Um, you mentioned that the rates went from 68% in 2012 to 74% in 2015. And one thing we have to keep in mind is the data for that actually came from the calendar year 2010 and 2013. So this is two years ago. Um, and so there's still a lot of, uh, of the gap to be made up. Uh, one of the things that we find difficult in this measure is that um, we're talking about an older population typically. and you know, many times if they fail one or two of the statins, they, they're done with statins uh, due to side effects. So um, even though this measure is looked at a population level, at the health plan level, we break it down to the patient. And we have to say, you know, um, we have plans from coast to coast, but each patient in each region is different. So what are the barriers to the medication uh, adherence issue? Is it cost? Is it transportation? Is it side effects? Is it lack of understanding from their provider. So I think really getting to know at the member level what the issue for adherence is, is what drives some of the improvement that we've seen. There's been a lot of investment from health plans in this um, measure, which I think is helping to drive the, uh, the population to be more adherent to their medication. So um, we've definitely had successes, but we are still up against many barriers. Uh, I don't think this will ever be a measure where we we know the full answer, um, so there's still a lot of work to be done for it. Um, so that was, you know, kind of a summary of the adherence measure. Uh, hopefully, I answered your question. So I know PQA has a new measure in development um, in regards to statins. So would you mind reviewing that for us? Sure. Uh, in 2014, uh, we developed a new measure using a very broad-based um, work group of about of a hundred of our members. And we looked at the ACC AHA guidelines, and the measure is called statin use in persons with diabetes, and it is the age range that's stated in the 2013 guideline of uh, 40 years to 75 years of old. Um, we had some input from the patient advisory panel that we use, which are made up of patients, obviously, because we were concerned that the guideline was too new. Remember, the guideline just came out um, the late 2013, and here we are trying to develop a measure around it. And we were concerned, many people in the work group were concerned um, that some of the ad adoption of the guideline would be delayed, that this measure would be hard to improve, and, and maybe we should wait a while. 
and the input from the um, the advisory panel of patients was really no. You know, we expect our physician to go out there and follow the guidelines, and and you know, if, and the prescription um, should follow that too. So they expected that a statin would be prescribed for those diabetics that are 40 to 75 years old. So we tested this measure in a very large database, and it looked like a good uh, measure. Uh, we were also concerned that you know, maybe there wasn't a lot of statin use in diabetes, but there actually was quite a bit. You know, it didn't start off as a measure of 40% or 50%. Um, and it showed lots of variation between health plans, which is also a, a good attribute for a measure. So it was endorsed by PQA members, uh, membership in November of 2014. So the specifications, again, of the measure, a um, little less complicated than the PDC measure, but it looks at that age range of 40 to 75 years old. And the population for diabetes, because again, this is a measure that only uses prescription drug claims for calculation, the measure looks uh, at two fills for any hypoglycemic um, medication. That's the proxy that we've used for diabetes, and we've tested that out using claims data. It's a good proxy. And then the numerator only looks for one fill of a statin medication, which is a bit of a low bar. So it's just one, one fill. And it doesn't look, as the ACC AHA guidelines talk about different levels of statins, it does not differentiate that because we don't know the clinical reasons. We only have prescription claims data for this measure. The numerator looks for one fat, uh, fill of the statin medication. But then we combine that with the PDC measure. And we, can, we have a good combination of two measures that looks at the, um, the prescribing of the statin medication in a, a high-risk population in the continuance of that statin medication. It's currently being reported to health plan sponsors by CMS in the patient safety reports for, um, by Medicare. And is considered for a display measure in 2017 that would be using 2015 data. So this is also a measure that, besides being actionable by health plans, is really actionable by pharmacists, too. So they clearly know their diabetic population, and they often have um, age information as well. So pharmacists that are filling medications, this is uh, you know, it's clearly based on guidelines, and they should be looking to see whether that patient might be a good candidate uh, for a statin. And, uh, and, and they can either intervene with the patient or their prescriber. So Mitzi, you know, this is a measure that's being reported to you now in your, in your patient safety um, reports. Have you started thinking about improving this? And if you haven't, what are the barriers? Um, so of course, it's a display measure this year. Who knows when it will actually be counted as a measure. And um, we've definitely started looking at some strategies around this. So our last data that was reported, the industry average is kind of scary. It's in the mid to upper 60s. So there's a lot of room to close that gap. And I kind of compare it to the diabetes treatment measure. So just for the entire audience to kind of level set, that was a previous measure that CMS tracked health plans on. And it looked at any patient that had diabetes that was on an ACE or an ARB. And there was a lot of barriers with that measure. And um, it took a lot of work with providers, with pharmacies, with the patients. And so I think we're going to see a lot of the similarities between this measure. So working with a provider, definitely number one, because they're really the driving force. One of the barriers that we saw with the diabetes treatment measure is because you had potentially an endocrinologist or a family medicine provider and a cardiologist, mm -hmm. that there might not be the uh, communication pathway that should be there. You know, these patients that fall into these categories are very complicated. and so things sometimes get overlooked. Um, and so working with providers, we were able to um, close some of that gap, and I think that'll probably be one of our first targets. But I also think retail pharmacists um, are gonna be critical in this measure because retail pharmacists are the ones that are out there in front of the patient, they have the communication with the provider, and so they're the almost the middleman between the patient and the provider so they can you know, talk to the patient about why it's important to take the medication that they may have gotten prescribed by their provider. And not only just get that one fill, because, you know, as you said, it's, it's kind of a surrogate. It's, it's one, one fill of the medication, but what happens after that one fill? 
do they continue to take that medication? Because as Dr. Pergrifka mentioned, only 40 to 50% of these patients stay on the medication at a year. So I think the statin and diabetes measure is going to be a little bit more of an uphill battle just because of that one statistic, um, but also because it, it, we're, we're starting out a little bit low. We kind of have that accelerator that I think you'll see in the first few years, the industry average will go up quite a bit and then we'll start to plateau because it's gonna be those, um, you know, those patients that they just can't tolerate statins or the providers have you know, tried it and they um, have failed it, you know, whatever those situations might be. So um, definitely something that we're looking at from a lot of different uh, perspectives and looking at the different levers we can pull in that area. Um, so, Dan, we heard about PQA's new measure. Um, would you want to tell us about any of the new measures that NCQA might have in this area? Sure. So, as I said earlier, we, re we retired our uh, cholesterol measures and it left us with a fairly big hole in the treatment of cardiovascular patients. We really had nothing there besides, uh, I think, the blood pressure control measure. Um, and so we began developing statin measures around the uh, patient groups that were defined in the ACCHA guidelines. So there are four groups that Dr. Pogrifka had described. Um, since HEDIS measures, or NCQA's HEDIS measures, rely on uh, administrative and claims data, um, two of the groups kind of are, are almost impossible for us to identify. So the uh, patients who have a high, uh, higher than average LDL, and patients who um, have a certain risk factor or a certain risk score, not really possible to identify in the admin claims. So what we did is we focused on patients who have established cardiovascular disease. So these are patients who have had a heart attack, who have diagnoses consistent with PAD or have had a stroke, um, who have had a PCI or a cabbage procedure. And then also in a separate measure, patients who have diabetes. And we use very similar methodology um, uh, that includes pharmacy claims as PQA, but we also have diagnoses with diabetes um, to identify our patients. Um, and so on our slide here, you'll see the two measures, a description of the two measures. Um, and there are some differences across the two. Um, one, uh, you'll see that the cardiovascular measure focuses on males age 21 to 75 and females age 40 to 75. Um, the age range of 21 to 75 is consistent with the ACCHA guideline recommendations. Um, but for females, since statin use is contraindicated for pregnancy or women of a childbearing age or who are trying to get pregnant, in discussions with our expert work groups, we received the recommendation that we should um, investigate whether or not the lower age range really should be 20, age range should really be 21 for females. And so in our testing, when we uh, looked at this, uh, the data for statin use and for the uh, patients that we've defined as having cardiovascular disease, the prevalence of, or the, sorry, the, um, the, the prevalence of uh, females that actually fall into the, 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 the category of patients who have this established cardiovascular disease that we're talking about was so low that it made sense to raise the lower age limit to 40. That way we didn't necessarily need to worry about including um, younger women who might be uh, pregnant. Um, you'll see in the diabetes measure, we follow the guidelines uh, to the letter and, and, and have it specified to ages 40 to 75 across both uh, sexes. Um, both measures, like I said, use administrative claims to identify uh, the eligible population, um, and they both use pharmacy claims and the PDC methodology that uh, Julie described to um, uh, uh, calculate the numerator. You'll also notice that there are two rates for each measure. Uh, the first rate is just did the patient receive a statin medication? Um, one difference between the two measures on that rate is that the cardiovascular uh, measure is focused on um, moderate or high intensity statin medication. So that is a recommendation from the ACCHA guidelines that patients with established ACVD um, should receive moderate or higher uh, um, intensity statins. Um, with the, diabetic, uh, the diabetes measure, we have it focused on any statin. Um, and this is because um, basically the, the patient population who has diabetes and does not have established ASCVD, um, we're, we didn't want to expose um, uh, the, those patients to unnecessary harms of statin medications. And we wanted to pr allow providers to have the kind of uh, range of choices of statin medications. We felt it was more important to get statins used in that population than to force the intensities right away. And that's something we might revisit in the future because um, the guideline recommendation is actually moderate. Um, 
The, the, the second rate for both measures is similar to the PQA measure, and that is um, for any uh, patient who received one statin during the measurement year, did they achieve an 80% uh, proportion of days covered? Um, I will say that uh, both measures uh, will be reported for the HEDIS commercial, Medicare, and Medicaid product lines. Um, and one final thing to note is that these measures just came out this year, so they're in their first year analysis. Um, that means that they will not be publicly reported. Um, the purpose of this is so that we can gather data, a large data set across all the plans that report HEDIS measures. Um, and then we will take that data, analyze it, see if the measure is performing the way it should, and tweak it where necessary. And then if our, um, our, our uh, decision-making bodies within NCQA decide it is ready for public reporting, we'd re uh, publicly report it for HEDIS 2017. Great. Well, before we move on to the economic piece of the management of dyslipidemia, um, I'm going to put you on the spot, Dr. Pogrifka. We've just talked about some of the quality measures that include statins and diabetes and um, some statin with adherence. From a clinician's perspective, how do you accept these? Because you're held accountable for HEDIS documentation and, you know, you're constantly having to I don't want to say check the box because it's more than checking the box, but what are your thoughts about these measures? Um, I, I guess my answer might surprise you, but I, I really don't feel held accountable by anything uh, other than my practice of, of, of better than standard of care medicine with my patients. I, I, you know, a lot of this is surprising to me, this discussion today, because I don't feel like I'm personally held accountable that much at all. I'm an independent solo practitioner. My patients come to me and want superior medical care and I try to give them the best care I can based upon, you know, I, I look at, at, at guidelines like ACC guidelines and NLA guidelines. Guidelines are a floor, not a ceiling. I mean, they're a beginning. You have to have a patient-centered discussion with each patient and say, you know, what are our goals here? What do we want to do? Are you afraid of medicines? You know, what can you afford? Uh, you, you know, so that's the kind of individual discussion I have with each patient. I, I really, personally, I, I don't feel much pressure from from uh, to achieve any form of, uh, of quality assurance or anything that we've talked about here. This is surprising to me. I guess somebody's watching what I'm doing, but I, don't, <laughs> yes. I, honestly, I honestly don't get a lot of feedback. Um, you must be doing a good job. Yeah, you're doing I, a good job be. then. <laughs> well, I, th there probably are studies. I'm, I'm almost certain there are studies out there that lipidologists who focus on this, because that's what I do. I do general internal medicine, but I do preventive cardiology and, and, and lipidology. So this is a, a major emphasis on what I do. So our adherence rates, I'm sure, are pretty high. And uh, Although we are getting the tougher patients, the patients who can't get the guideline, uh, who can't get the goal, who keep having repeated events, patients who can't take a statin. So we're getting uh, some pretty tough patients. So I, I assume I'm doing a pretty good job. I, the, the hassles I get are insurance coverage hassles for brand name medicines versus generics. We have these new PCSK9 inhibitors, which I have a number of patients, a small number of patients on already, and um, I've been surprised at how easy it's been to get those patients approved. I'm, I'm using the medications as clinically indicated, obviously, and we've been able to demonstrate the need, fill out the proper forms, and the patients are on the medicine within a week or two. So it's been, it's been very pleasant so far. Great, thank you. So finally, we've talked about the clinical perspective of the management of dyslipidemia. So now we're just going to look a little bit into the economic implications. Um, we've all seen the numbers out there, and they're, you know, astounding. Uh, you know, the I think the number one stat that is really thrown around is from some 2011 data where the estimated annual cost of cardiovascular disease is about $320 billion. It's a combination of direct and indirect costs, um, but it's still, you know, one of the leading causes of death. And, um, you know, when you look at some of the indirect costs, you look at productivity, um, quality of life, et cetera, it, it's, it's pretty impactful to the uh, population. Um, when we look at the mean per patient charge for surgery, um, coronary re revasculation, uh, that was about $150,000 uh, $150, uh, with the mean charge per PCI was about $70,000. So we're, you know, we're talking about some not so cheap procedures here. Um, one of the things that I like to focus on is uh, the number of studies that have been written about um, treatment of dyslipidemia. 
And uh, one of the books that I own, it's probably at this point 12 or 13 years old, but it's about that thick and it's each page is just one abstract of the study and that's way out of date. Um, and now there's about 43,000 studies out there. And so what's even more surprising about that is that when you look at those studies, only about 700 to maybe 1,000 of those actually focus on cost, which um, cost is a really big driver of the treatment of dyslipidemia when you look at all aspects, the indirect and the direct um, cost that uh, we face. So in the future, as we're looking at some of these studies that are coming out with the new agents and some of the current agents, we need to see more of an emphasis on what the high cost of uh, actual dyslipidemia is versus um, the cost-effective treatment for these disorders. So if we can avoid an event, what, what have we saved ourselves? And so looking more at the cost on top of just the outcome of the study is really needed in the future. Um, if you look at the economic impact on some of the more uh, recent and more popular studies, uh, ASCOT is one that uh, is most familiar to the population. And ASCOT is, uh, when you look at kind of the overall theme of it, there was, there was definitely about a $400 additional drug cost increase, but it saved, uh, when you look at the cardiovascular event that it prevented, it saved about $12,000. So um, that was a big cost avoidance there. And then if you look at Access and Stellar, which are also um, two of the bigger trials as well, um, average values that were saved there was about fifteen to 20000 per life year saved. And I'm sure we could go on with all of the different um, studies that are out there. There's been quite a few um, landmark trials in the past 10, 15 years. So really looking into the future, what do we need to see with these new agents? We've talked about the PCSK9 agents. and. Um, you know, they're, they're not cheap agents, and you know, when you compare it with a statin and just on paper, um, you know, what does that mean? What are we preventing? What, what type of events are we preventing with these agents? You know, definitely adherence comes into this. So if you get an adherent patient um, on one of the new agents versus a statin where you take it every day, uh, yeah, the cost may be more, but what are we uh, preventing in regards to events. So all of that kind of needs to be um, filtered out a little bit more. And in the long term, we just need to see some of the uh, advantages over um, the statin use. But, you know, they're indicated on top of statin therapy. Um, it, it's not a um, solo indication. Um, so it is a, you know, for the very complicated patient currently. Um, so, I, have, oh. I have a question for you. Uh oh, so, yes. Uh, and, and before I ask the question, I want to make a comment about cost because you know we have a model out there for the cost of these PCSK9 inhibitors already, and they're the biologic medicines that we use for rheumatoid arthritis and such. We're improving, you know, quality of life for rheumatoid arthritis patients. Uh, I don't know if we can mention names here, but we all know a famous golfer that's able to win tournaments and such because he's taking a wonderful biologic to treat his rheumatoid arthritis, and that's fantastic. But here we're talking about drugs that are preventing death. And, and sudden death and, and heart attacks and stroke, the number one cause of disability in our older patients, we're talking about the same kind of cost for, I think, potentially more benefit. I mean, I'm not knocking uh, you know, prevention of deterioration of disease and rheumatoid arthritis, but I, you know, and I'm a cardiovascular person, so I guess I'm, I'm biased, but I think there's you know, potential for, for real benefit from these drugs at about the same cost as we're already paying for these biologics. So that is sort of you know, we sort of have a ballpark range in mind for cost. So my question to you is, you know, how can you and I work together to improve uh, patient tolerance and adherence to medications? We've heard how terrible uh, patient adherence is. I mean, what can you and I do together? What clinicians and, and people like the other folks here on this panel, how can we improve patient adherence? You know, I think this is an area that we're seeing a lot more advancement in just over the past few years working together with providers. And um, one of the things that I found very interesting from what I do from my team's perspective is a lot, a lot of providers have no idea once that patient walks out of the office with that prescription, what did they do with it? Are we talking about primary non-adherence, secondary non-adherence? And so when we as a health plan go to a provider and say, here are your patients that are non-adherent, 
many providers are like, well, they tell me they they take their medication when I see them at the office visit. So, what we found has been helpful is that collaboration between health plans, uh, pharmacies, and the patient and the provider to say, here is what's really happening. You are not taking your medication, and to be adherent, you may think that uh, to the patient you may think that missing one or two doses a week is adherent, when in fact we know that that is not adherent behavior. So I think really, you know, in the past it's always been the health plan's been the bad guy and then you have the provider, but I think we're really moving towards a model of how do we work together because we can't survive without the provider's input and you guys, you know, it's very helpful when we can bring you the behaviors of the patients that you may not you know, see otherwise if you just see the patient twice a year. So I think we've really seen advancement in that perspective. You know, I can tell you, I rarely get that kind of data. And when I get it, I love it. And I, my staff will call the patient and say, what's the problem? How come you're not taking your medicine? But I get that data very rarely. I don't know if there's a different situation in Maryland, if it's me, because I'm doing a pretty good job of getting people to go. But I, I would love as a clinician to have more of that kind of data, and I'm not getting it as to you know, what the adherence rate is in my individual patients. Yeah, so. that, that's definitely something that any of the health plans you work with, I'm sure, would love to give you that data and help yeah. you there. It's, <laughs> very, it's, uh, it's very spotty. A few plans do, but I, the majority of patients, yeah. I'm not getting that data at all. I don't, I don't know how to get it. I'm, you know, I don't, I don't yeah, know. and I think one thing we've learned is that you know, we've all seen the PowerPoint slide of a doctor in his office with just piles of paper everywhere, and it's like, what am I supposed to do with this? And so really saying, okay, you have a thousand of my patients, here's my top 20 at-risk patients, and here's the ones that you need to manage the most. And I think that's where we've kind of gotten a little bit better with sharing the data. So I just want to bring up one perspective from the pharmacy um, component. And it's wonderful when a health plan can give you all of your data for their, the patients that they cover. But if you ever have a question about, gee, this patient says that they're getting the medication, but you know nothing's happening here, that pharmacy knows too. So, and you know, as the one nice thing about measures is that, you know, we, it has drawn attention to adherence across the board. So it's not just the health plan, it's not just the provider, um, it's also the pharmacy. So the pharmacy can also provide that information on a patient specific basis. Great, thank you. Um, so just moving on to the um, next slide, we have the economic impact of drug therapy for um, LDL lowering. So, I mean, at the end of the day, when we have an adherent patient, we're going to have an overall lower cost of care. So as we just discussed, how do we get to that point? Um, and I think that is one of the movements that we've definitely seen over the past few years, and I think it's only going to get better from this point. Um, we've seen less ER visits um, and inpatient hospital stays uh, when we have an adherent patient. Um, so I think that is also definitely cost savings because we all know that those ER visits are what drives up some of the healthcare costs overall. Um, and then, you know, when we look at, look at this from a health plan perspective, we have lots of new therapies coming into play. Um, and, you know, with all the different guidelines, um, there's going to be a lot of changes um, that are going to have to that are going to have to be balanced with the current therapy options, and you know, getting to that happy medium is something that uh, you know it sounds like from your experience is happening already, um, and that's good to hear. Um, but really, making sure that the right patient is getting the right therapy when they need it. Um, so overall, uh, kind of the theme of the day has been optimizing uh, the patient outcomes and the cost efficiency in treating dyslipidemia. Uh, question number one, according to updated 2014 National Lipid Association guidelines, assessment and therapy for management of the patient with dyslipidemia should focus on all of the following parameters except, A, identification of ASCVD risk based on clinical parameters and risk factors, B, initiation of ASCVD risk-based lipid lowering therapy, C, provide goal, provide goal percentage reduction LDL levels in all patients, D, use of high or moderate intensity statins with or without non-statins if necessary to achieve goals, or E, maintenance of lipid goals to assess effective reduction of atherogenic lipoproteins and enhance adherence. So we'll give you just a few seconds there to put your answer in.
All right, so the correct answer on this one is to provide goal percentage reduction in LDL levels in all patients. Um, so, Dr. Uh, P, if you want to, do you have a few comments on that? Uh, just as reminders of. Uh, well, it, it, remember, this is one of the questions where it says accept. So, the false one here for the NLA guidelines is C, identification of statin. Yes, thank you. Uh, identification of statin benefits groups. So, uh, remember the different philosophies um, that we're looking at between these two sets of guidelines. So, the NLA guidelines, as we see in A, we're trying to identify uh, the patient at risk. We're not starting out with saying, well, let's you know, identify um, these four groups that we know that statins work. We're just looking at the individual patient. You're sitting in front of me. I'm trying to assess your risk. So how are we going to do that? We're going to use clinical parameters, risk factors, what your triglycerides are, what your age is, uh, whether you have hypertension, whether you smoke, whether you have a family history. We're using those clinical factors to identify risk. B, initiation of ASCBD risk-based lipid-lowering therapy. So we um, the intensity of our therapy is based upon the intensity of your risk factors. You have uh, higher risk, we're going to use more intensive statin therapy. It seems simple. Uh, we're not, as I said, the false one is we're not identifying statin benefits groups. We're, we're working with individual patients. We're going to use either high or moderate uh, intensity statins with or without non-statins to achieve goals. Now, uh, as I said, we're going to uh, modify our intensity of statin therapy based upon how far we have to go. If your LDL cholesterol is up here, we need a high-intensity statin as opposed to whether it's intermediate. And I left this out in the discussion earlier. One big difference between the NLA recommendations and the ACC guidelines is the use of non-statins, which we uh, utilize heavily in the National Lipid Association patient Center recommendations. Why is that? Even though the randomized clinical trial data isn't um, as extensive with non-statins as it is with statins, it's there. We were talking amongst ourselves earlier the use of, um, about the use of ezetimibe. And you know, for years, we didn't have clinical trial data, RCT data, showing that ezetimibe added to statins in terms of risk reduction. We now have that with a trial called the Improve It trial. So the LDL hypothesis, if you will, that lower is better, has been um, verified for the first time with a non-statin drug, okay? And uh, knowing the pathophysiologies of the situation, we believe we can extend uh, that evidence to the PCSK9 inhibitors. We don't have the clinical trials in yet. I'm actually a participant in um, a principal invest investigator in several PCSK9 trials. So we've got people out there. We'll have data in a few years, but improve it you know, shows that for the first time we can use a non-statin to reduce risk on top of a statin. And we believe the same thing will happen even better, even to a greater extent with PCSK9 inhibitors are so much more powerful than ezetimibe. And then maintenance of lipid goals, of course, that's a big difference with the NLA um, guidelines because we really believe in these absolute targets, LDLC less than 100, non-HDLC less than 130. Um, those are optimum numbers for high-risk patients. We really believe that using these absolute targets improves patient adherence. It, it, it assures that we're reducing the number of atherogenic lipoprotein particles to an acceptable level to reduce the disease and the clinical events. Okay, moving on to question two. What is considered the minimum appropriate proportion of days covered or PDC threshold for therapy adherence for an adult receiving statin therapy for dyslipidemia? A, 50%, B, 60%, C, 70%, D, 80%, E, 90%. I'll give everyone just a few seconds. All right, the correct answer is D, 80%. Julie, anything you want to add about that? You know, it's a threshold. Um, and we don't expect this measure ever to be 100%. Uh, so reaching that 80%, that's the threshold where you hope that the medication um, is being useful to get to the achieved outcome. Great, thank you. Moving on to question three. Mr. Green is a 69-year-old white male with a one-year history of hypercholesterolemia with a baseline LDL of 200 milligrams per deciliter that has been previously treated with therapeutic lifestyle change in two different statin drugs atorvastatin initially followed by rosuvastatin due to failed response. Despite this, in the 30-pound weight loss, his LDL remains high at 170 milligrams per deciliter. Nicotinic acid therapy was initiated three months prior, but the patient experienced severe nausea and vomiting, and niacin therapy was discontinued. The patient was also diagnosed with atherosclerotic heart disease two months prior 
with myocardial ischemia in the right coronary artery territory. His cardiologist has made the decision to initiate therapy with the PCSK9 inhibitor agent, Alirocumab. Which of the following should be his starting dose for therapy? A, 75 milligrams subcutaneous weekly, B, 75 milligrams subcutaneous once every two weeks, C, 150 milligrams subcutaneous weekly, D, 150 milligrams subcutaneous every two weeks, or E, dosage should be based on patient's weight. Again, we'll give everyone just a few seconds to get their answers in. And the correct answer is B, 75 milligrams subcutaneous once every two weeks. Dr. Progrufka, would you mind commenting on the dosage of the sure. new agent? Is it okay if I comment on the whole case? Absolutely. <laughs> well, it, it, this is a great case because um, this uh, patient, Mr. Green, indicates both of the indications for alirocumab. That is, the drug is indicated uh, for those potentially with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And the simplest way to screen for that is an adult with an LDLC greater than 190. So I would tell anyone listening to this, if you ever see a patient with someone with an LDL cholesterol greater than 190, they should probably be sent to a lipidologist for further evaluation. The, the FH disease state, we don't do genetic testing in this country. It's not widely available, but there are, there are several sets of clinical criteria that have a fairly uh, accurate positive predictive value to identify these patients. Why is it important to identify these patients? Because once you identify one patient, like Mr. Green, with an LDL cholesterol 200, you can screen his family members and identify other patients. This poor man already had a myocardial infarction. Wouldn't it be wonderful uh, if we could identify one of his children before they have that? So that's the reason why you want to identify familial hypercholesterolemia. Also, the other indication for alirocumab is a patient with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease who requires additional LDLC lowering. So he certainly requires additional LDLC lowering, and he's had a manifestation of disease, uh, a heart attack. So the dosage, the correct answer being B, this is the dosage that was established in clinical trials as being um, the, the most efficacious dosage. Um, the drug has to be given, uh, it, it could be given weekly, but it's, it's not necessary. I, I, obviously, uh, even though patient adherence has been very high with these meds, uh, we want to use the least number of injections to get us to where we need to go. So the, the correct dose is 75 milligrams subcutaneous once every two weeks. If you don't get your um, desired LDLC reduction, you can certainly increase it to 150 every two weeks. So. And how long would you give a patient to get to that desired goal treatment? Um, that is a great question. As I mentioned, my, my patients have only been on the drug for, um, for, for no more than a week, but it, it, these drugs, um, I don't believe work as quickly as statins. Statins work within uh, basically a few days. You get um, you get reduction of LDLC. I, I believe the time frame is going to be um, a, a bit longer. Certainly, I would reassess patients probably at about three months out. You know, something like that. I, I haven't really established my protocol yet because the meds are so new. But that's that's what I'm thinking. Great, thank you. Okay, the next question. Um, data from the ASCOT study demonstrated X in health cost savings per cardiovascular event avoided despite a $400 additional drug cost related to dyslipidemia therapy. A, 3,000, B, 6,000, C, 9,000, D, 12,000, E, 15,000. The correct answer for this question is D, 12,000. If you remember, we discussed the ASCOT study and even though there was that additional increase in drug cost, the overall events that were avoided uh, were $12,000. So um, the additional drug cost was well warranted. But now I'm going to open it up just for some of the questions that have come through um, on the uh, webinar. And um, we will start with, um, let's see here. How about Dan and Julie? We haven't given you guys a chance to talk in the last few minutes. So can you help explain the difference between the measures that uh, you guys discussed and how they're used? Um, I don't know who wants to start us off. Gotcha. Sure, I'll start a little bit. Uh, <laughs> um, our measure, and again, we use the same methodology, PDC, so that's where they're similar. We're looking at adherence. 
Ours is a, is a not so narrow measure. So we're looking at any population, regardless of disease state, that receives two statins. Uh, and importantly, uh, a lot of people are covered under prescription drug plans where there's no diagnostic data. So this measure can be used for those plans to report on um, without having um, diagnosis involved. Right, and so um, contrast to the PQA measure, the NCQA measures that are just coming out this year, we are using clinical data um, through claims. So we identify the population that should be on statins for the cardiovascular measure by looking at claims for um, diagnoses like um, a previous heart attack, or they had a heart attack in the previous year, um, they've had a cabbage procedure, uh, PCI, um, they have coronary artery, di or, or, sorry, coronary artery disease um, or peripheral arterial disease or stroke. And for our diabetes measure, measures, the same thing. We look at diagnoses consistent with diabetes um, and then we also look at um, um, prescriptions, or sorry, dispensing of uh, medications for diabetes to identify the populations. Great, thank you. And we had a question come in um, in regards to how important is statin adherence in reimbursement? So I'll take a first stab at that and then I can pass it over to Julie. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we're working more with providers around adherence. And, um, you know, we have uh, medical homes, ACOs out there. Um, and, you know, we look at our collaboration agreements. We're seeing more and more of this written into collaborations in regards to reimbursement to the providers. So. Um, you know, how are the providers doing with the overall measures? And that's tied to different levels of reimbursement. Um, you know, in the future, it, it could roll over into retail pharmacies. Um, and Julie might be able to comment more on that, on, uh, you know, how they might get measured in relation to kind of like a STARS measurement. Um, so I think reimbursement is, you know, hitting all different areas with adherence. Um, and so it, it's only going to get bigger is my thought on that. Yeah, I'd agree. You know, I, I love to hear that health plans are going to engage pharmacists that have the patient in front of them to talk about adherence. And I think that's a great strategy. So there are platforms out there. I mentioned earlier PQS, Pharmacy Quality Solutions, and uh, they can report to the pharmacy where they stand compared to other pharmacies like them uh, to see how they can improve. And they can identify specific patients that might come in next week or they can target that. So, you know, this is, action is what this is all about. Um, and this provides an actionable measure and rate for those pharmacies to improve the adherence of their patient population. Great. Uh, Dr. Pergrifka, I have a question. Um, and you mentioned the genetic testing earlier. Right. And it's not readily available here. So what is your prediction in the future? I mean, it seems like this would be a perfect example of prevention. It's, you're almost preventing multiple events at that point. And so wh where do you think that's going? Um, I, I think what's going to happen, uh, there are models abroad. The, the Netherlands, for example, has a, a wonderful national screening program. Is there's, there's some kind of, uh, for some reason, there's an increased instance of heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia in that population. So they do much more widespread, widespread genetic screening. But you know, I, I, I'm not sure how that's going to change things to have genetic screening. It'll happen because the price is coming down of all genetic testing. And, one of the labs I work with, uh, I think, is going to offer it over the next few years. So, you know, there, there are patients who, particularly when you talk about treating uh, an adolescent, for example, I mean, I see children with genetic dyslipidemias, and the, the parents really want to know, you know, no, no, mm -hmm. before they commit the patient to a medication that the, their child is. They're obviously concerned, even though side effects are, are rare. But, you know, right now, I feel pretty comfortable with the clinical criteria we have that are are essentially no extra cost. They're, they're clinical criteria based upon uh, family history, um, the, the cholesterol levels themselves, uh, certain physical findings and such. I, I'm pretty comfortable with what we have. I'm not, I don't really think I'm in a rush. I, I think it might help with adherence a bit. You know, if I told you I knew for sure that you had this disease, I think that might move a, a certain percentage of patients into the adherent column. So that's, I, I you know, I, I think that's where it might help some. That's interesting you say that because uh, many patients that are on statins, it's a secondary prevention. They've already had an event right. 
and now, their adherence is for genetic dyslipidemias, right? I, okay. I mean, and that's remember that's a small minority of people who get atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It's it's you know one in 350 Americans has heterozygous FH. I mean that's yeah, fairly common, but but it's only about 20% of people that have um, heart attack that have premature heart attacks actually have a genetic you know, um, a monogenetic disorder, a simple disorder. Most cholesterol abnormalities are polygenic, so it's a number of different genes. And we're, I don't know if we're gonna be able to diagnose that genetically in our lifetime. I was talking about the simple, single gene genetic variants. So. Okay, so more of the primary prevention. Right, yeah, okay. exactly. Um, we've also had a question of, you know, we went through the assessment questions at the end, you talked through that case. And, um, you know, can you give us some real life examples of, the, you know, the patients that you currently have on? What, what's their profile look like? Um, the, the, what I'm, oh, let me start off by saying what I'm disappointed that I haven't been able to do so far and will probably won't be able to do in the near future. I, 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 as a lipidologist, I see a lot of primary prevention patients. So I see patients who haven't yet had an event and are coming to me for screening. And, and many of them, uh, have um, uh, an inability to tolerate statins because they have statin intolerance is highly prevalent. The usage trials showed about 20% of patients have such severe statin myalgias, muscle aches, et cetera, they can't tolerate statins. So I see a huge number of those patients. Their primary care providers or even their cardiologists don't know what to do with them. And right now, the, the, the PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, we have a, another one pending approval next week, um, but it doesn't look like they're going to be indicated for that population. So that's somewhat disappointing. Now, as clinical trial data rolls in, we have trials specifically looking at statin intolerant patients who haven't had an event. So primary prevention, statin intolerant patients. So that, you know, we've, we've got trials underway. Hopefully we'll, we'll get some data. The patients I have are secondary prevention patients. They've already had an event, um, heart attack or stroke. Um, their LDL cholesterol either isn't where I want it to be um, with uh, maximum statin, maximum tolerated statin therapy. So I put them on a PCSK9 inhibitor. And remember, for some patients, maximum tolerated statin therapy might be none. If you've failed, you know, uh, uh, as the patients I often see have failed four, five, six statins. There's seven statins on the market now, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, so some patients can't tolerate any statin. They've been on all seven. So they, uh, of the three patients I have on it, two patients aren't able to tolerate any statin at all. They've had an event. Bingo. Now we have a new tool in our toolkit. The, the other PCSK9 inhibitor, to be fair, uh, pending approval next week, will be uh, evolocumab, uh, and that's widely expected to be approved next week. So we'll have two new, um, new uh, weapons in our toolkit against atherosclerotic disease. I like that, the weapons. Yeah, that's what we think of. We have, we, have a, you know, we have a bigger, more potent weapon. And all, in, in general, most patients on these PCSK9 inhibitors will be on a statin already, but some, as I said, can't tolerate even any dose of statin, so. Great, thank you for that description. So I think we're gonna um, end it. I have uh, one question for both of uh, you guys again, Julie and Dan. What do you see the PCSK9 inhibitors uh, in the future of measure development? Where do you see them fitting in? Um, well, I mean, typically for measure development, we will need lots of evidence and data. Um, before we can consider it, um, and even bef even after there's lots of data out there, um, we typically will require there to be some type of guideline recommendation from authoritative source like the ACC and AHA or the NLA um, before we would be able to develop a measure. And for NCQAs, per, uh, specific to NCQA, you know, we implement things at the plan level, um, and, and sometimes that's a little bit of a blunt instrument because you cannot individualize treatment, um, that you can't include individualized treatment for patients. So you don't wanna be on kind of the bleeding edge of all the new therapies and all the new treatments. Um, we kind of have to wait until there's a more established recommendation that we can put out there at the plan level, at the national level before. So that, that's kind of, I, I think it would probably be several years before we would be able to uh, create a measure around the uh, new drugs. Yeah, I'd echo that. Um, but one of the things that we do at PQA is to look at any new medication that comes out in reference to established measures. So we'll be taking a look at the two measures that we've talked about today, the PDC measure, which is really just statin therapy. And because uh, it's an add-on, these new medications are add-on to statin, I don't see that that will be uh, the 
the addition of this medication would be included. But we'll go through the process and make sure that whether or not it should be an exclusion, whether we should even consider it. All right. Well, that sums up the evening. That was the end of our questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. And with that, everyone have a great evening.